Okay. So for one last time, welcome back. Uh, the last talk of the day is by Katya Scheinberg from Lehigh, and she's going to talk about a new way of analyzing stochastic optimization methods. Katya. Thanks a lot, um, and uh, thank you for being here on a Friday evening, essentially. Um, and I have to apologize, my slides are a little heavy on detail, but I'll try to do as good a hand-waving as Ben did. No, I'm not going to even try that. But <laughs> I, I, I do appreciate the difference that he's able to do it and I'm not, but I'll try still to aspire. Anyway, so I changed my title to be also cool because everybody else had a cool title, so my title is now using stochastic, I mean, analyzing stochastic methods by Martin Gales. Okay, uh, so I'll go over some introduction and basically I will um, give a bit of motivation that is very familiar to everybody, but just the, actually a lot of talks here already refer to the concepts and the sort of the motivation that I'm trying to project. Um, so, you know, you look at classification problems, for example, it doesn't have to be a classification problem. Um, and we know that ultimately we're trying to construct a classifier that maps X to Y. Uh, and there is something that we're trying to achieve. There's an optimization problem there. So I'm talking about essentially how machine learning have influenced mach um, optimization in the last decade or so. So there, there is an optimization problem in every machine learning problem. We're trying to do something, but whatever we're trying to do is not actually what we're doing, right, usually. So we, we want to find a classifier with the best error or the best maybe AUC, uh, but the best error is usually an integral, right, an expected value that we cannot compute, so we don't try to optimize that. We, instead, we try to optimize some uh, finite approximation of that, and moreover, the finite approximation is also a function that we typically don't know how to optimize because it has this weird mm, stepwise shape, so derivatives are useless, um, so it's a, not a nice smooth function, so we replace it with a nice smooth function, either, you know, in some way by smoothing or by replacing it with a surrogate loss, and then we try to optimize that. So the, you know, for, by now, like at least a couple of decades, the optimizers have been hearing uh, from machine learning community that the optimization problem we're trying to solve, we don't want to solve them exactly because basically what we are solving is not what we, what we can optimize is not what we're really trying to optimize, right? Uh, so there, there's been now development in theory behind it, and, uh, but essentially we, we all know that what we're trying to solve is a stochastic optimization problem of some kind, and we're re really trying to solve some approximations of it. And uh, moreover, these approximations sometimes are also very large scale. So there is, for example, if you have a finite, um, uh, sum here, this sum may contain very many items and having many items, uh, I mean terms in the sum is a good thing because it gives you a better approximation. But also it's difficult for optimization algorithms because evaluations are more costly. So all of these things basically created kind of a new uh, setting for optimization and we as optimizers, we're now trying to make sense out of it and, and produce algorithms that are, that work in this domain, but are also still theoretically um, justifiable. So, first of all, there's a new scale, uh, and by new scale, okay, it's, first of all, it's much larger possibly scale than we used to have in typical problems, but it's also new scale in the sense that it's not only the dimension that's large, but their function, objective function, is maybe a sum of many, many, many terms and uh, you may not want to evaluate them all at the same time in every iteration. Uh, there is inherent stochasticity possibly in your, um, most likely in your objective function that it, in, in fact it is stochastic and random. Um, and um, basically, right, what you're solving is not what you actually uh, want to solve, right? You replace loss, maybe uh, some loss with some other loss. And then um, you, you don't really want to solve things exactly. So what does it mean? It doesn't mean you should use bad algorithms, right, to solve the problem in exactly. What you should do is to use this uh, ability to be inexact in every iteration to be cheaper, to, cre to make your good algorithms cheaper and uh, therefore, you know, benefit from this uh, inexactness. And, um, 
you know, one of the benefits to optimization from interacting with machine learning community and computer science community is that everything now is about complexity. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. So you have to have complexity bounds, otherwise, you know. Um, all right. So my setting is going to be basically stochastic optimization in a classical sense, uh, except for, so we're minimizing some nice smooth objective function. And it is stochastic, meaning that I cannot compute its values or its gradients or anything like this, but I can compute their estimates. And the only thing I'm not writing here is that the estimates do not have to be unbiased. They basically need to be, they don't even need to be consistent in some cases, depends what algorithm I'm talking about, as it turns out. But typically, stochastic optimization rights, we minimize the expected value. We don't have to do that. We can actually tolerate outliers and some, um, in, in um, uh, some uh, estimates that are not uh, necessarily um, give you, you know, uh, unbiased. Okay. Right. So, uh, I'll give, I'll go through motivation of what we're trying to do. The actual things that we're doing will be kind of in the end, and they're a bit technical. So, uh, as long as I can, you know, give you the motivation, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy. Um, so, first motivation is adaptive methods. So, uh, stochastic gradient descent that has been so popular uh, is, is, you know, a great method and it works essentially as follows on every iteration and it's variance, not just stochastic gradient, but it's variance. On every iteration, you take some kind of a estimate of the gradient by averaging out a bunch of samples and then you take a step along the negative direction along that estimated gradient and you need to have, uh, you basically predefine the number of samples uh, that you take on every iteration and the step size on every iteration. They can change as you go along, but, but it's the predefined kind of a um, sequence. Uh, and uh, what we all know now is that most of these algorithms are extremely sensitive to, you know, the choice of the step sizes and the batch uh, size. So it's not really, you know, um, a great, um, uh, it's not a great feature of these algorithms. And yet, in deterministic optimization, we all along knew that taking fixed step sizes, for example, is a bad idea. You should adapt your step sizes to the curvature of your functions, right? So you, as, a, as you go along, you should be able to adapt the features of your algorithm, such as step size, to the function that you have at hand, and this is, gives you a much better algorithm. But it's not really easy to do with stochastic setting, and you'll see why. So basically the question is, the first motivation is, can we um, design and analyze adaptive, step, step, al adaptive steps algorithms? So I'm going to talk about two algorithms. You probably all know them. The first algorithm is line search algorithm. It's very classical, but until now it hasn't been really, you know, adapted to stochastic uh, setting in a at least justifiable, theoretically justifiable way. So this is the, um, the line search you you estimate your gradient you, or, you know, some other descent direction. You take uh, the step size along that direction and you check the sufficient decrease condition called Armijo condition or some other condition. And if you, if it's satisfied, then you basically um, uh, increase your step size and progress. If it's not satisfied, you decrease your step size. So this is how you adapt the step size. Then uh, another um, algorithm uh, is trust region. It's basically, it works better for non-convex optimization problems. It's a very similar algorithm except for uh, you don't go along a direction. You specify a radius where you believe that you have a good approximation of your function. We call it a model. So a model approximates your functions such as first or Taylor series, second Taylor series expansion. You minimize that model in a trust region and then you, again you check sufficient decrease condition. If it's satisfied, you increase your uh, trust region radius and proceed. If, it, if it's not satisfied, you um, decrease it and, rest and do it again. Now, here you can already maybe see where the stochastic uh, part is not going to work. So let me even go back here. So the problem with stochastic, uh, with, with doing line search for stochastic algorithm is twofold. So first of all, your direction so the only way the, the line search works is because you assume that once you cut down the step small enough, you will always make a step. You won't get stuck. But if your direction is not a descent direction, then there's no guarantee that you will ever move anywhere. So you might get stuck simply because your direction is not the descent direction. 
And then another reason is that you have to have um, these estimates of the function values or the function values themselves to be able to tell whether your function is decreasing or not. So sufficient decrease condition requires you to know the function. If you don't know the function value, how can you uh, guarantee this decrease? Okay, and this is the same for thrust region basically, essentially. Okay, however, these methods have advantages, and uh, the advantages are essentially the convergence rates. I mean, not only these methods have, um, are robust in terms of picking the initial step size, because they adjust the step size, they also, like normal full gradient uh, kind of uh, descent methods, they have good convergence rates. So these convergence rates are all down here, the stochastic gradient ones are below, uh, the, small, the lower table, the higher table are the classical kind of line search or trust region algorithms based on first order information only. And uh, you can basically see that in every um, um, class of functions with just smooth non-convex functions or convex functions or strongly convex functions, uh, these methods have faster convergence rates per iteration. Okay? So, uh, then the question is also can we uh, have similar complexity bounds for stochastic optimization for some of the methods. So not stochastic gradient, but some other methods for stochastic optimization with good complexity bounds. Now, uh, we're not the first ones to ask this question. There has been a lot of work recently basically on various forms of uh, uh, variance reduction methods. So the, the only way you can achieve better complexity bounds for stochastic optimization is to reduce variance of your gradient and um, you know, Hessian and whatever estimates. And this is what we'll be doing as well. Uh, and there's been a lot of work on that. I have several um, papers listed here, but uh, nevertheless, there is um, uh, basically, there is no adaptivity uh, in the, well, rather, it depends on the paper that is listed here, but some of them cannot adapt basically uh, to the step sizes or cannot adapt the step sizes, cannot adapt the batch sizes. So the, you need to increase the batch size uh, to get variance reduction, but the, how do you uh, change the batch size depends basically on the paper and none of them are really adaptive. So they either um, need to know the scheme in advance, like increasing batch size, for example, um, geometrically on every step, or uh, like in the last paper, which is actually trying to do adaptive um, uh, batch sizes, and um, it's a nice paper, it can only do adaptive uh, batch sizes uh, where you know the true gradients, in theory. In practice, they do you know, good things, but for theoretical convergence, they need to actually adapt the batch size with the knowledge of the true gradient, which of course is not available. Okay. Uh, there are several more papers with complexity analysis, which is also strong uh, in terms of um, convergence rates, um, except the, these papers uh, all basically, they have stochastic information on every step and they assume that it's deterministically um, good on every step. So basically with some probability the information is good enough, therefore, you know, if you run the algorithm for t step with probability p to the t, it's going to um, you know, work on every step. So it's deterministic analysis, not really a stochastic analysis. We're trying to combine these things and put the analysis of these methods into truly stochastic framework. That also gives us uh, another question. Um, so what is it that we're actually trying to prove? What does it mean to show complexity bounds? So in deterministic optimization, complexity bounds are very specific. Complexity bound and convergence rates are interchangeable. They actually use you can say complexity bounds, or you can use, say convergence rates, and they're kind of the same thing. Because what you show is, for example, the following. Say, let's take non-convex optimization. You converge to a first-order stationary point, uh, which, or near stationary points, which means that you're looking for an iterate where the gradient is below epsilon. So you say, your question is, how many iterations do I need to get a point where the gradient falls below epsilon? And uh, here is the answer. So if the gradient be below epsilon, the number of iteration has to be on the order of one over epsilon squared, okay? That also means that uh, I have convergence rates. I can say that if I run the algorithm for t iterations, my gradient is going down, or the minimum gradient that I'm observing is going down at the rate of one over square root of t. 
uh, or the square gradient goes one over t, right? Um, however, now when we have a stochastic algorithm, then the question is what it is, we don't have a deterministic statement, right? We have a statement, let's say, an expectation. So what is that we're taking expectation of? So a typical analysis that has been um, performed in, uh, in the stochastic gradient analysis is basically it talks about expected value of um, some random output, basically, of an algorithm. Um, so you run the stochastic gradient algorithm, you then take a random iterate that you've encountered in t iteration, you measure the gradient at that iteration, and that gradient in expectation is bounded by something. So what we would like to bound, because we you know, feel it's a stronger bound, is the actual number of iteration it takes an algorithm to get an iterate where the um, uh, the gradient is below epsilon. So it's more like the complex, it's, it's really, so the first, the, the stochastic gradient has a convergence rate, expected convergence rate, but it doesn't have expected complexity bound. What we're talking about is expected complexity bounds. So can we say something about the number of iteration it actually takes the algorithm to get to this point, rather than bounding the expectation of the gradient after some iterations, okay? Is that clear the difference? Right. Okay, uh, so uh, this kind of analysis actually, we, we've done this analysis before, my colleagues and I, and then, you know, my colleagues with other colleagues <laughs> had done this analysis before, um, and uh, this sort of what I'm talking about is based off this initial uh, analysis that we've done, but the difference is that we've done it only before for randomized algorithms, but not for stochastic algorithms. The difference was, uh, there is some stochastic information that you can have, but we assume that you can um, compute the function values exactly. So the functions were not stochastic, the algorithms were stochastic. So there's a difference. So now we're, um, you know, in a purely stochastic setting. Okay, so this is the motivation number four. I I'll skip that. It, it just, in some cases, you can have some garbage in your estimates, and some of the stuff that we do tolerates this garbage. So this is just explanation why we don't why we would like to avoid uh, insisting that our estimates are biased. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna introduce the stochastic trust region, which is essentially the same thing as the trust region algorithm, exactly. Uh, and then, I, because it's just an algorithm, I'm not gonna talk about assumptions yet. I'll explain what are the tricky parts. Um, I'll talk about line search a little bit, then I'll talk about the general framework where the analysis is, what analysis is based on, which is basically a stochastic, a stochastic uh, processes framework. That's where the martingales are coming in. And then we'll have the results that are basically um, coming out of this. Okay, so uh, stochastic trust region. So this is the trust region method, as we said before, and I will slow down a little bit here. Uh, so in every iteration, we build a model of the objective function, which is random. It comes from stochastic gradient, stochastic Hessian, uh, subsample function values, whatever. Um, so you build a model like this, then you minimize this model in the trust region. So in, in a ball, that's easy, there is no stochasticity there, not necessarily at least. And then you compute, uh, oh, sorry. There is an error here on the slide I forgot to fix. So these red functions, they're not really function values, they're estimates of the functions. It should be estimates of these red quantities, not the true ones, because we don't know the true ones. So we compute the estimates of the function values. So clearly our results are gonna depend on how accurate these things are. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about. That these things have to be accurate enough, but in an adaptive way. Um, and then, you know, the rest of it, it goes the same way as before. So we take a step uh, if, the, if we believe that the function is improved. Um, we take a step. If we believe that it's not improved, we don't take a step and we shrink. So everything is great. So here is the picture that will hopefully give you much more intuition. So there are four things that can happen. So here is the, in blue, so in red is my function. In blue, it's a model, it's some kind of approximation of this function, right? 
Uh, in red triangles, red triangles are the estimates of the function. They're not exact. The first picture presents a good picture. They're not exact, but they're accurate enough. I have a reasonably good linear approximation of my uh, red function. I have reasonably good estimates of the function. And everything is great. So green is, uh, the green lines are my trust region. The middle point is my current iterate. The red function is telling me, sorry, the green, the blue model is telling me to go down in this direction, right? This is my next iterate is at the edge of the trust region in that direction. I measure the two red triangles. They tell me my function is decreasing. I'm taking that step and I'm happy, right? So everything is good here. Everything works deterministically. Now, in this case, uh, I have a bad function. My function is completely wrong. Um, and I'm trying to go in the direction which is not a descent direction for the true function, and I detect it by observing that my red triangles are, you know, uh, telling me the function is increasing. Again, my function estimates are pretty good. So what happens here is I'm wasting an iteration. This is a wasted iteration. I could have taken a step if I had a good model, but I didn't because um, my, um, uh, the, the, the model was completely wrong, so I will not take a step and I'll shrink the step size. Okay. Uh, then, yeah? Mm -hmm. No, 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 but blue is a model, right? Blue is telling you that you should go there. Yeah, so model is wrong, but the red is what you're really trying to optimize. You know, so I wouldn't take the step because, uh, right, so um, the blue is telling me, so at first I minimize the blue and I go to the left. Then I check the red values. The red values is telling me the function is increasing at this point, so don't go there. Right, so I will not take that step, which is good. Um, but then, uh, in this case, it's the opposite situation. I have a good model. The blue is my model. I minimize it. It says go to the right. I take the red estimates. Red estimates are lying. They're saying don't go because the function is increasing. It's not actually increasing. It's decreasing, but they're wrong estimates. So they're telling me not to take the step. So again, I wasted the step. And then finally, I can have the situation which is the real trouble uh, where the model is telling me to go to the left, which is wrong, and the estimates are also wrong, so it's saying, yes, yes, go there, it's gonna be good, but in fact, my function is increasing, so I'm taking a completely wrong step. And that's the bad case, because basically that means my function has to, can increase sometimes. And if I can increase function sometimes, uh, and if I want to prove convergence of any sort, I need to make sure that somehow in expectation, when I'm taking this, when I have this stochastic process, my function is decreasing. And that's where the difficulties lies in analysis because you really have to offset what can happen in bad cases with what can happen in good cases. And if you cannot control the increase of the objective function, then you're in trouble. And with line search, it's actually really difficult to do. So <clears throat> the stochastic line search essentially had to be changed a little bit precisely because of these difficulties. And it, uh, I'm not going to go into details, but it has kind of an additional control. It's still a line search. The method works pretty much the same. The, the only difference is basically that, uh, as I said, we, to have any kind of convergence guarantees, we have to make sure that our estimates uh, have to get more and more accurate if the, um, basically, if we're thinking we're close to optimality. Uh, and we think we're close to optimality when our steps are short or the gradients are small. Um, and so basically these controls have to be a little bit more um, carefully picked. But nevertheless, everything is adaptive in these algorithms. Everything depends on the current state of affairs. You don't need the knowledge of any full gradients or anything like this. You just need to know uh, your current step sizes and your current uh, gradient estimates and things like that. Okay. So how do we analyze these algorithms? Now that you have the sort of the taste of the algorithms, here is the basically the framework. So here I can claim that I'm also doing control because I didn't think of this, but recently somebody said, oh, you have a Lapuna function there, apparently. 
So uh, we have a stochastic process, and this Lyapunov function is this function phi, because that's basically a function that w with which we measure progress. So there's a function phi, well, there's a stochastic process with phi and delta. So what is phi? Phi is a measure of some kind of progress, basically, and it will depend on the algorithm. It will be a different function depending on the algorithm and the functions that we're trying to optimize. Um, but in the general framework, it's just some phi, we'll, and then delta k is, is a, some parameter of step size. So that's what's adap adaptive in terms of, uh, you know, we, we take a step, we increase it, we don't take a step, we decrease it, okay? And then this, it's a stochastic process, and it should have a stopping time. Uh, this is what we're after, and the stopping time is basically when we get to op op sufficient optimality. Right? when optimality um, that we, you know, epsilon optimality is satisfied. Again, depends on the setting. In non-convex case, it's the gradient below epsilon, otherwise it's something else. So we have a stochastic process and it's stopping time. We want to bound the expected value of the stopping time. Okay. So what do we need? We need some assumptions, obviously. So first assumption uh, is on this um, uh, step size parameter. The step size parameter has to behave as a random walk. So what happens in deterministic optimization with step sizes? How does it work to, when we analyze deterministic methods? We basically, we have our line search, we shrink the step size and we say eventually the step size is going to be small enough that we'll always take a step and therefore the step size will never become too small. And that's how you show progress. You just say, okay, at some point, I'm guaranteed to make progress. This is not the case here because things are stochastic. Things can fail. Uh, but as long as when the step size is small enough, it behaves well, then we're fine. So behaves well, it means it's a geometric random walk with an upward drift. Okay, that's what we want. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's basically how this, um, you, you multiply the step size by two divided by two, but if it's more likely to be increased than decreased, that you have a geometric random walk with upward drift. Uh, now, what about this Lyapunov function or this function phi? So, what we need from it is basically that in expectation on every step, it is decreased by some function of the step size. Okay? So, we cannot guarantee a finite decrease in expectation because it's a function of a step size and the step size can in potentially be arbitrarily small. But it, it has to be a function of the step size. Okay, so we can do that. So these are the assumptions and the analysis of particular algorithms just depends on fitting your algorithm into these assumptions, showing that they, they hold. Okay, but once you have these assumptions, uh, okay, these are the details, uh, the cool details coming from Martingales, but um, basically what you do is you analyze that, that frequently enough your step size returns to large enough value. So, you know, with some frequency it has these large enough values and then whenever it has large enough values your phi gets decreased by a finite, uh, you know, um, finite amount. And you have to use uh, Wald's identity. That's why we care about the fact that it's super martingales and that's why, and we need stopping time and all these nice properties from the stochastic processes. And Wald's identity is what, we, what one can use to bound the expected stopping time in uh, stochastic processes. So we do that and we get basically the following bound. And what this bound is, so we'll see what it becomes in um, you know, every particular case, but, uh, there is this p over 2p minus 1. Where did this p come from? This p is basically the probability that your step size is going up versus going down, right? So the p, if p is large, then this number is small. If p is close to a half, then it blows up to infinity. And that's bad. Uh, now this one half is, can be changed actually to anything positive. It doesn't have to be a half. Uh, by playing with an algorithm, but I'm not going to get into details of that. Oh. Sorry? So this h is the amount by which phi decreases on every step. It's a function of uh, the step size. But you'll see, it's basically, it's going to be epsilon squared, and you know, this sort of thing. 
but yeah, so it, it, it will change on, it, it's a guaranteed decrease and it depends on your, um, okay, so now basically, yeah, exactly, we're gonna plug things in. Um, okay, so first, what, it, what do we require? for the convergence. So like we're, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna show you analysis for every algorithm. I'm gonna just say what the assumptions are and then that we can fit it then into the framework under these assumptions and then we'll have uh, the conclusion of the convergence rates. So what are the assumptions? Uh, for trust region, for first order convergence, uh, we need uh, that the difference between the true gradient and the estimated gradient, so the gradient of the model, is proportional to trust region size. Okay, so this is where adaptive batch size comes in. We know the trust region size is given to us. It goes, it's maybe larger in the beginning of your algorithm, it may get smaller when you get to the optimality. So depending what it is, I need the accuracy to be proportional to that. So I'll know exactly how much to sample, assuming that I have bounded the variance of my, you know, gradients and so on. I'll know how much to sample uh, because, you know, of the, of the size of the trust region. And in the beginning, I don't, don't need a lot of samples, and when I get closer to the optimality, I need more samples. So it's very reasonable. Uh, function values have to be more accurate because they need higher order of, you know, approximation. So they need to be um, uh, accurate with respect to uh, you know, the trust region is squared, right? So this is like Taylor series. In Taylor series, you have to have second order approximation to the function values and first order approximation to the gradient. Um, now, if I want second order convergence, uh, I need uh, the same things, but now my gradients have to be estimated with the accuracy of uh, delta K squared, my Hessian to accuracy should be delta K, and the, uh, the function values have to be delta K uh, cube. Now, have to be, I'm talking about, it's a probabilistic statement, right? So nothing has to happen 100%. These are all, only have to hold with some given probabilities. These probabilities do not have to increase in time, they have to be constant, they just need to be high enough. So the probability of having good estimates and good function and good gradients and good Hessians uh, are basically denoted by PG and PF, and that P that came in in the stochastic process is essentially the product of these two. So the P is the probability of everything being good. So if you have good estimates and good uh, models, you know, I have a good step. Uh, that, that's the probability P, and then everything works for my algorithm, okay? For line search, it is similar. Uh, we only did first order analysis. We didn't do second order analysis because then you need, it's a Newton method essentially, and it's different, but um, uh, the, there's a little bit more uh, requirements. That, as I said, line search is more complicated, and um, the, uh, the difference between the gradient and the gradient estimate is actually proportional to the gradient estimate itself, which is a little odd, but um, it, it, that's the only known thing, otherwise you have to put true gradient on the right side. And then there's this extra control that controls the um, variance of the function estimates. So it's, it's a little bit more technical. And again, uh, the probability of having everything good is the probability which, with which your, um, you know, things work well. Okay, and then we have the, uh, the results. So trust region, uh, first order convergence rate. Uh, the delta k is the trust region. The phi function is, it's not exactly the dis distance to optimality. It's, I said it's a measure of progress. So it is a combination of the function value and the trust region radius. So it, it, it's basically, it's a trick to show that something will go, go down on the iteration. So it's, um, it's not an obvious thing. Um, and the stopping time is uh, getting to the gradient below epsilon, and the convergence rate, rather, the complexity bound is one over epsilon square, or L over epsilon square, which is exactly what deterministic method has, except for there is this P term here. 
So again, probability P is close to one, then this term is negligible, and if it's close to, say, a half, it becomes important. But we're recovering deterministic convergence rates, essentially. Uh, second order, same thing, except for now your stopping time is different. It's getting to the second order stationary point or approximate second order stationary point. And again, we recover the convergence rate for the deterministic methods, which is L over epsilon cubed. You can put two different epsilons if you want. It's different. It's, it's, everything carries out basically the same way. Uh, for line search, uh, we have to come up, we have to come up with an even more complicated phi. Uh, so the delta k is a step size parameter, but the phi is now a combination of various things. Uh, again, measures some kind of uh, progress. Um, and in non-convex case, the stopping time is the um, gradient going below epsilon. And again, we recover the convergence rate, except, again, because it's a more complicated situation with line search, we get L cube there, which we think we can get rid of, but at the cost of much more complicated analysis. So the, the dependent on Lipschitz constant is kind of lousy here, but dependent on epsilon is the same as deterministic. And then if you want to do analysis for convex uh, functions, it just falls out by changing. So you have a phi determined as above, but what you apply analysis to is this psi, oh, yes, psi, which is a modification of phi. So your left on a function changes a little bit. And then you can have analysis and you get deterministic convergence rate of one over epsilon, so the classical convergence rate of stochastic gradient, oh, sorry, gradient descent with the um, convex functions. And finally, for strongly convex functions, again, you change your psi to the log. Um, uh, so you play with it a little and then you get the linear convergence rate, which is, um, again, deterministic rate. Yep. So, what do you mean? So, the phi k is, uh, so, okay, what's the question? So, the, the, when you're trying to show, so, f to, to apply the stochastic process analysis, we need to show that something decreases on every, so what decreases is the psi, okay? And psi is the log of phi minus whatever, and the phi is that. So you see up there, like second oh, row. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's the same phi as for non-convex call, whatever, but uh, what you apply the, L, yeah, whatever. So, I mean, in, in a deterministic analysis, uh, you'll do the same thing, uh, but the phi would be just f of x k, essentially, minus f min. So that would be just that, and you don't need anything else. Uh, and then you would also apply, you'll show that uh, the log of that thing de decreases by, some constant. That's how you show linear, I mean, one of the ways to show linear convergence. Um, well, okay, uh, basically, that's also, we have a powerful framework because we fit in several algorithms in it, so we really believe in it, and we actually think that can go beyond adaptive step sizes and other things. This, I think the stochastic process uh, framework can be changed uh, I mean, if I knew more about how to apply Wall's identity, I'd probably expand it very easily, but I usually need some help of the specialist to do that. But um, I think it can apply to quite a few uh, other algorithmic framework. Uh, what we also observe from this is that um, uh, we, when we run these algorithms and we use kind of sampled gradients, Hessians, and function values, you really need a lot more out of function values than out of gradients, and you need a lot less out of gradients than, or somewhat less out of gradients than out of Hessians. So you can get away with algorithms that estimate Hessian just a little bit, estimate gradients a little bit better, and really need to work hard to estimate the function values if, you know, it is um, basically something that you can allow your algorithm to do, and then they have all these wonderful convergence properties. And then uh, because of um, tolerance to some biasness in the estimates, we can occasionally have um, some noisy, uh, like true noise in the functions. Um, and basically what we're uh, showing here is that classical optimization algorithms with just minor modifications, to, well, modifications are just uh, basically to control the accuracy, they can work with iteration failures. 
So as I said, there's, uh, there's been analysis where it's assumed that everything is good in every iteration. We do not require it. We basically um, uh, can analyze things when, uh, can analyze the convergence when algorithms uh, have failures on, from, from time to time, basically, on some of the iterations. And this is my last slide. It's a little bit of depth learning for the end of the day. <laughs> so, yeah, Ben had some <laughs> citation from Lance Armstrong, you know. So the problem is not the problem, the problem is your attitude about the problem. Okay, thank you. Questions for Kathy? Yes, go ahead. Okay, right, um, so in general, uh, you can have the uh, probability bounds as well for this, because I mean, essentially, to go beyond the bound, you, like, the, the, the so you need, uh, so you, your bound is basically says that I'm, I'm gonna reach the uh, accuracy after so many iterations. To go beyond that, you need iterations failing one after the other. So it's gonna exponentially decrease in probability. But your question is actually fairly complicated for the setting because if I use more samples per iterations, so, I mean, to decrease the probability, I should use more samples. Or I should increase the probability of success per iteration. But if you have finite budget, right, is it worth it? So this trade-off probably for strongly convex is possible to analyze because you know how things change, but for as long as it's convex or non-convex, it's very hard to really analyze this properly. From practical perspective, I don't know. I mean, I think these bounds are overkill, really. You really don't need that many samples per iterations as this bound suggests. So I would use much fewer samples and just, you know, most likely you'll get somewhere good within your budget, but, but I would increase. The point is I would still increase the accuracy per um, iteration in some, with some scheme. Yeah, I know it, I didn't quite answer it, but yeah, yeah. Well, so, so I mean, it's not my, methods are standard, right? These are standard <laughs> methods. Uh, so, uh, the question is uh, dependency on, uh, in what sense? So, when the, talking about convergence rates, there's no dependency on dimensionality, but the, there is, um, you know, the, the, the steps themselves, like trust region step, trust region um, algorithm, you have to minimize a quadratic in a ball that is like, you know, depending what method you use, has complexity dependent on the dimension, for sure. Um, then the rest is when you build a model, it really depends how you build these models. So, I mean, some, some of the work comes out of like Hessian, in large scale cases, you can maybe uh, do some kind of a, uh, uh, what is it called, sketching on the Hessian to do approximate Hessian vector products or something that will reduce your dependency of the dimension. But that's really kind of a little bit beyond. So our thing is a little bit too general to really say how much your dependency. You can play around, and this is where inexactness comes in. People want inexact methods to lower the dependency of the dimension uh, and complexity on the, of every iteration, but how much inexactness can you tolerate? This is what we're trying to answer. I have a quick question, unless there's somebody else. I asked you my question. Hmm? Yeah, okay. Uh, is there any hope that there would be some sort of meta theorem that says, you know, for this class of algorithms, the stochastic analog would have the same rate, or do you really have to find this Lyapunov functions on a case by case basis for? Well, so far, yes. Uh, I don't know. I mean, they're not that different from each other, but uh, 
they are sort of analogs of what you do in, um, you know, but I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah. In, but I mean, this, they're not that hard to find, so this is already, um, but yeah, I don't know. Other questions for Katya? I saw a hand. Not less. Thank Katya for a great talk again. Thank you.